Section 4 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Section 4 The Roll Call of the Reef, Part 1 by A. T. Quiller Couch. Yes, sir, said my host, the quarryman, reaching down the relics from their hook in the wall over the chimney piece. They've hung there all my time and most of my father's. The woman won't touch em. They're afraid of the story. So here they'll dangle and gather dust and smoke till another tenant comes and tosses em out of doors for rubbish. Phew! Tis coarse weather, surely. He went to the door, opened it, and stood studying the gale that beat upon his cottage front, straight from the manacle reef. The rain drove past him into the kitchen, a slant like threads of gold silk in the shine of the wreckwood fire. Meanwhile, by the same firelight, I examined the relics on my knee. The metal of each was tarnished out of knowledge but the trumpet was evidently an old cavalry trumpet, and the threads of its party-colored sling, though fretted and dusty, still hung together. Around the side drum, beneath its cracked brown varnish, I could hardly trace a royal coat of arms and a legend running, Per mare per teram, the motto of the Marines. Its parchment, though black and scented with wood smoke, was limp and mildewed, and I began to tighten up the straps under which the drumsticks had been loosely thrust, with the idle purpose of seeing if some music might be got out of the old drum yet. But as I turned it on my knee, I found the drum attached to the trumpet sling by a curious barrel-shaped padlock, and paused to examine this. The body of the lock was composed of half a dozen brass rings, set accurately edge to edge, and rubbing the brass with my thumb, I saw that each of the six had a series of letters engraved around it. I knew the trick of it, I thought. Here was one of those word padlocks, once so common, only to be opened by getting the rings to spell a certain word which the dealer confides to you. My host shut and barred the door and came back to the hearth. "'Twas just such a wind, east by south, that brought in what you've got between your hands. Back in the year nine it was. My father has told me the tale a score times. You're twisting round the rings, I see, but you'll never guess the word. Parson Kendall, he made the word, and he locked down a couple of ghosts in their graves with it, and when his time came, he went to his own grave and took the word with him. Whose ghosts, Matthew? You want the story, I see, sir. My father could tell it better than I can. He was a young man in the year nine, unmarried at the time, and living in this very cottage, just as I be. That's how he came to get mixed up with the tale. He took a chair, lighted a short pipe, and went on, with his eyes fixed on the dancing violet flames. Yes, he had been about thirty year old in January, eighteen nine. The storm got up in the night of the twenty-first of that month. My father was dressed and out long before daylight. He never was one to bide in bed, let be that the gale by this time was pretty near lifting the thatch over his head. Besides which, he'd fenced a small tatty patch that winter, down by Lowland Point, and he wanted to see if it stood the night's work. He took the path across Gunner's Meadow, where they buried most of the bodies afterward. The wind was right in his teeth at the time, 
and once on the way, he's told me this often, a great strip of oarweed came flying through the darkness and fetched him a slap on the cheek like a cold hand. He made shift pretty well till he got to Lowland, and then had to drop upon hands and knees and crawl, digging his fingers every now and then into a shingle to hold on, for he declared to me that the stones, some of them as big as a man's head, kept rolling and driving past till it seemed the whole foreshore was moving westward under him. The fence was gone, of course, not a stick left to show where it stood, so that when first he came to the place he thought he must have missed his bearings. My father, sir, was a very religious man, and if he reckoned the end of the world was at hand, there in the great wind and night among the moving stones, you may believe he was certain of it when he heard a gun fired, and with the same saw a flame shoot up out of the darkness to windward, making a sudden fierce light in all the place about. All he could find to think or say was, The second coming! The second coming! The bridegroom cometh, and the wicked he will toss like a ball into a large country." and being already upon his knees, he just bowed his head and bided, saying this over and over. But by and by, between two squalls, he made bold to lift his head and look, and then by the light, bluish color twas, he saw all the coast clear away to Manacle Point, and off the manacles in the thick of the weather, a sloop of war with top-gallants housed, driving stern foremost toward the reef. It was she, of course, that was burning the fire. My father could see the white streak and the ports of her quite plain as she rose to it, a little outside the breakers, and he guessed easy enough that her captain had just managed to wear ship and was trying to force her nose to the sea with the help of her small bower anchor and the scrap or two of canvas that hadn't yet been blown out of her. But while he looked, she fell off, giving her broadside to it, foot by foot, and drifting back on the breakers around Carn Dew and the Varses. The rocks lie so thick thereabout that twas a toss-up which she struck first. At any rate, my father couldn't tell at the time, for just then the flare died down and went out. Well, sir, he turned then in the dark and started back for Kovrak to cry the dismal tidings, though well knowing ship and crew to be past any hope and as he turned, the wind lifted him and tossed him forward like a ball, as he had been saying, and homeward along the foreshore. As you know, tis ugly work, even by daylight, picking your way among the stones there, and my father was prettily knocked about at first in the dark. But by this twas nearer seven than six o'clock, and the day spreading. By the time he reached North Corner, a man could see to read print. Howsoever, he looked neither out to sea nor toward Kovrak, but headed straight for the first cottage, the same that stands above North Corner today. A man named Billy Ede lived there then, and when my father burst into the kitchen bawling, Wreck! Wreck! he saw Billy Ede's wife, Anne, standing there in her clogs with a shawl over her head and her clothes wringing wet. "'Save the chap,' says Billy Ede's wife, Anne. "'What do you mean by crying stale fish at that rate? "'But tis a wreck, I tell ye. "'I've a zedin too, and so has everyone with an eye in his head.' 
and with that she pointed straight over my father's shoulder, and he turned there, close under Dolor Point, at the end of Kovrak Town, he saw another wreck washing, and the point black with people, like emmets running to and fro in the morning light. While he stood staring at her, he heard a trumpet sounded on board, the notes coming in little jerks, like a bird rising against the wind, but faintly, of course, because of the distance and the gale blowing, though this had dropped a little. "'She's a transport,' said Billy Ede's wife, Anne, "'and full of horse soldiers, fine long men. When she struck, they must have pitched the horses over first to lighten the ship, for a score of dead horses had washed in afore I left half an hour back. And three or four soldiers, too, fine long corpses in white breeches and jackets of blue and gold. I held the lantern to one, such a straight young man. My father asked her about the trumpeting. That's the queerest bit of all. She was burning a light when me and my man joined the crowd down there. All her masts had gone. Whether they carried away or were cut away to ease her, I don't rightly know. Her keelson was broke under her, and her bottom sagged and stove, and she had just settled down like a setting hen, just the leastest list to starboard. But a man could stand there easy. They had rigged up ropes across her, from bulwark to bulwark, and beside these the men were mustered, holding on like grim death wherever the sea made a clean breach over them, and standing up like heroes as soon as it passed. The captain and the officers were clinging to the rail of the quarter-deck, all in their gold uniforms, waitin' for the end as if twas King George they expected. There was no way to help, for she lay right beyond cast of line, though our folk tried it fifty times. And beside them clung a trumpeter, a whacking big man, and between the heavy seas he would lift his trumpet with one hand and blow a call. And every time he blew... The men gave a cheer. There, she says, hark ye now, there he goes again. But you won't hear no cheerin' any more, for few are left to cheer, and their voice is weak. Bitter cold the wind is, and I reckon it numbs their grip of the ropes, for they were droppin' off fast with every sea when my man sent me home to get his breakfast. Another wreck, you say? Well, there's no hope for the tender dears, if tis the manacles. You better run down and help yonder, though tis little help any man can give. Not one came in alive while I was there. The tide's flowing, and she won't hold together another hour, they say. Well, sure enough— the end was coming fast when my father got down to the point. Six men had been cast up alive, or just breathing, a seaman and five troopers. The seaman was the only one that had breath to speak, and while they were carrying him into the town, the word went round that the ship's name was the Despatch, Transport, homeward bound from Karuna, with a detachment of the Seventh Hussars that had been fighting out there with Sir John Moore. The seas had rolled her further over by this time, and given her decks a pretty sharp slope, but a dozen men still held on, seven by the ropes near the ship's waist, a couple near the break of the poop, and three on the quarter-deck. Of these three, my father made out one to be the skipper. Close to him clung an officer in full regimentals. His name they heard after was Captain Duncanfield. 
and last came the tall trumpeter, and if you'll believe me, the fellow was making shift there to the very last to blow God save the king. What's more, he got to send us victorious before an extra big sea came bursting across and washed them off the deck, every man but one of the pair beneath the poop, and he dropped his hold before the next wave, being stunned, I reckon. The others went out of sight at once, but the trumpeter, being, as I said, a powerful man as well as a tough swimmer, rose like a duck, rode out a couple of breakers, and came in on the crest of the third. The folks looked to see him broke like an egg at their very feet, but when the smother cleared, there he was, lying face downward on a ledge below them, and one of the men that happened to have a rope round him, I forgot the fellow's name, if I ever heard it, jumped down and grabbed him by the ankle as he began to slip back. Before the next big sea, the pair were hauled high enough to be out of harm, and another heave brought them up to grass. Quick work, but Master Trumpeter wasn't quite dead, nothing worse than a cracked head and three staved ribs. In twenty minutes or so, they had him in bed with the doctor to tend him. Now was the time, nothing being left alive upon the transport, for my father to tell of the sloop he'd seen driving upon the manacles. And when he got a hearing, though the most were set upon salvage, and believed a wreck in the hand, so to say, to be worth half a dozen they couldn't see, a good few volunteered to start off with him and have a look. They crossed Lowland Point, no ship to be seen on the manacles nor anywhere upon the sea. One or two was calling my father a liar. "'Wait till we come to Dean Point,' said he. Sure enough, on the far side of Dean Point they found the sloop's mainmast washing about with half a dozen men lashed to it, men in red jackets, every mother's son drowned and staring. And a little further on, just under the Dean, three or four bodies cast up on the shore, one of them a small drummer boy, side drum and all and nearby part of the ship's gig with H.M.S. Primrose cut on the sternboard. From this point on the shore was littered thick with wreckage and dead bodies, the most of them marines in uniform, and in Godrevy Cove in particular, a heap of furniture from the captain's cabin, and among it a watertight box not much damaged, and full of papers by which, when it came to be examined next day, the wreck was easily made out to be the primrose of eighteen guns, outward bound from Portsmouth, with a fleet of transports for the Spanish War. Thirty sail I've heard, but I've never heard what became of them." Being handled by merchant skippers, no doubt they rode out the gale, and reached the Tagus safe and sound. Not but what the captain of the Primrose, Maine was his name, did quite right to try and club-haul his vessel when he found himself under the land. Only he never ought to have got there if he took proper soundings, but it's easy talking." The Primrose, sir, was a handsome vessel, for her size one of the handsomest in the King's service, and newly fitted out at Plymouth Dock. So the boys had brave pickings from her in the way of brasswork, ships, instruments, and the like, let alone some barrels of stores not much spoiled. They loaded themselves with as much as they could carry, and started for home, meaning to make a second journey before the preventive men got wind of their doings and came to spoil the fun. Hello, 
says my father, and dropped his gear. I do believe there's a leg moving. And running for, he stooped over the small drummer boy that I told you about. The poor little chap was lying there, with his face a mass of bruises, and his eyes closed. But he had shifted one leg an inch or two, and was still breathing. So my father pulled out a knife, and cut him free from his drum. That was lashed on to him with a double turn of manila rope, and took him up and carried him along here to this very room that we're sitting in. He lost a good deal by this, for when he went back to fetch the bundle he'd dropped, the preventive men had got hold of it, and were thick as thieves along the foreshore, so that twas only by paying one or two to look the other way that he picked up anything worth carrying off, which you'll allow to be hard, seeing that he was the first man to give news of the wreck. Well, the inquiry was held, of course, and my father gave evidence, and for the rest they had to trust to the sloop's papers, for not a soul was saved besides the drummer boy, and he was raving in a fever, brought on by the cold and the fright. And the seamen and the five troopers gave evidence about the loss of the despatch. The tall trumpeter, too, whose ribs were healing, came forward and kissed the book. But somehow his head had been hurt in coming ashore, and he talked foolish-like, and twas easy seen he would never be a proper man again. The others were taken up to Plymouth, and so went their ways. But the trumpeter stayed on in Covrack, and King George, finding he was fit for nothing— sent him down a trifle of a pension after a while, enough to keep him in board and lodging with a bit of tobacco over. End of Section 4 The Roll Call of the Reef Part 1 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.